Welcome to Math 12, Mathematics of Legos. If this is not the class you were expecting, uh, there's, I think, one spot still remaining, so you're welcome to try to switch in. So there's a lot of different ways that this class can go. I've given you some suggestions. If you had signed up earlier in an email I sent, I'm open to exploring other things as well. One of the big things is I need at least three volunteers, and I know some people have already expressed interest in coming with me to the elementary school. I will be saying a little bit more about that later. I just on the mechanics side, I am Steve Miller, Professor Miller. I am a professor in the math stat department. My main research interests are number theory and probability, but in the last few years, I've actually gone more and more interested in applied math and projects. And so I will actually be teaching a class next year in all likelihood on applications of mathematics in the real world, working with local companies. And so I've been doing that for a couple of years with William students on a variety of projects. If any of you are interested in stuff like this, I am happy to talk to you. For some of the things, it's better not to have the cameras recording it. It has a more frank and honest conversation as to what is it actually like to try to apply mathematics in the real world. I am happy to reach out if you want to grab a coffee, if you want to go for a walk, if you want to get lunch. I know at least one person has expressed interest in coming with me to lunch after today. Uh, one of the things that William says extremely well is professors can always swipe students in. I have been at other institutions where they do not encourage interaction nearly as much. Uh, at one school, which will be named Princeton, they wanted to charge my wife and I $5 each to play tennis with two of my students. And since we're playing doubles, we're not really taking up more courts than are already there. And so I think it's wonderful how well Williams does in terms of encouraging people to meet each other, not just within the college, but within the broader community as well. And so, you know, again, I know this is winter study. There is a spectrum of how involved people want to be on classes. I completely understand that. I'm not gonna push anything on you, but if you want to, happy to try to get to know you. You know, there's around 30 students in this class. That is a lot of people. Anyways, All right. So the main goal for the idea is the, for the class is the Lego Idea Challenge. How many of you know what the Lego Idea Challenge is? All right, you will you learn very, very quickly. So. Lego has had a lot of changes in their philosophy and their outreach. And one of the things they are doing now is they actually encourage people to create Lego things and submit suggestions for new sets. And if you get enough people to support, Lego will consider making it. And they will work with you to improve your design. So given that we only have three or four weeks and that I have run this course numerous times in the past, three or four weeks is not enough time to really start from scratch, have a good idea and do everything. So we've tried in the past, we've never really gone and done. So I have done some preliminary work with my children. And so we have made a working Lego Rubik's Cube. I'd, it does not work well, okay? It works. Years ago, there was a lawsuit. Uh, some company had created a tablet that dissolves in the washer and cleans your clothes well. And another company came up with another tablet and they were sued by the original company. And their defense was, no, 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 your product dissolves well, we never claim. So the cube works, it does not work well. So what I wanna do now is let me, let me shift. Let me try to shift, oh. So stop share. All right, so this is my daughter. 
Um, so I will have this on as I'm chatting. The cube works. Right, out of curiosity, how many people can solve the Rubik's cube? It takes about an hour to learn how to solve a two by two if you don't care about learning how to solve it well and efficiently. To do a three by three, you only really need to learn, I think, two more moves from the two by two to get to the three by three. So if anybody is interested, I am happy to you know, have a class or two where we learn stuff like this. Now I was thinking, how do I convince you that this actually works? Well, one thing is to turn it in every direction, but that takes time. So I could ask you, how about the class chooses just one side and I'll show live that that one side works. If I chose a student at random, would you trust me? What could I do if I wanted to be dishonorable? No one can think of anything I could do to be dishonorable? Yes, I could plant a student. So speaking of planting a student, Right. So I could plant a student. So how many students would it take me? It would just take one. And as long as I know to call on that student. So what could I do to convince you that the student is not a plant? I'll choose a student who then chooses a student. Right? Would that convince you? Why not? Two. Two. Okay. So I could just have two plants. So an interesting question, you know, I see mathematics everywhere. How many plants do I need? What if I just said, let's have the class vote on which side to turn? How many plants would I need then? So there's about 30 people in the class. Depends on whether or not I get to vote. So would six be enough? The six sides. The six sides. Right. So would you like to, I mean, do you trust my daughter over here? Sure. So does, do people want to, we'll speed things up. What side should I turn? Yell it out. Red. Okay, red. I heard red. So first loud voice wins. All right. So over here, the way it works is I will pick up the red. Hopefully this works. Turn it a quarter and then put it down. If I really wanted to be safe, I do have to be careful. Maybe there's a tendency for people to like red or blue or yellow. It's possible you could have 16 people that you need before you can be safe, right? But do we all agree that if I had 16 people, I would be safe? The 30 people. How many people do you think I really need to be safe? You know, 16, assuredly, I will be okay. But how many plants do you think I could probably get away with? Do you think I need as many as 16? Well, what do you guess would be a pretty safe number for me? We've got 30 people. How many people do you expect to get each side? So let's say only one side works. How many people do you expect would vote for each side? We have 30 people, six sides, five. So if you expect to get about five from each side, if I got four or five people to just all vote for one specific side, would that be enough of a boost? Probably, maybe not, probably 10 people would be enough. You know, there's gonna be enough distribution of people among the different sides. And some of you would actually choose the side I wanted that if I had 10 of you as plants, that would probably enough, four would probably have been safe. And I will admit, I did debate emailing four people before class today and saying, could you be my plant and choose you know, the following side when we do this? Uh, out of curiosity, how many of you know the joke about the two students who were late to the exam? All right, I will tell as fast as possible. So two students are solid A students. They're destroying the class. They're having no trouble. They decide that, you know what, let's spend the weekend, let's visit some friends at another college and we'll just come back for the exam Monday morning. Well, unfortunately, they party far too much. They are very drunk, they oversleep, and they get back to campus, you know, five minutes before the exam ends. 
and they don't really want to show up. You have know, five minutes left. So they wait and late in the afternoon, they go to the professor. They say, we're really sorry. We missed the exam. We were visiting you know, friends and we got a flat tire on the way home. And okay, so some of you, I think, know where this is going. And the professor says, you guys are the two best students in the class. It's a formality for you guys to take the final. I, I trust you guys. It's not a problem at all. When do you want to take the exams? Tomorrow? Okay, sure. So tomorrow they go in, they take the exam. First question is a very easy problem. If it's a chemistry class, it's on molality. If it's a math class, maybe it's you know, solving a quadratic equation. It's worth five out of 100 points. And the second question worth 95 out of 100 is, which tire? So how many people, you know, if you think about this right now, let's just spend a moment. What tire would you choose? All right, does everybody have their tire? So you've got 30 people. About how many people should be going for each tire? Yeah, around six. So, you know, give or take. What are you trying to do? What is your objective in this problem? I'm sorry? Yes. It's not to say which tire was actually flat, because no tire was flat. It's what tire do we think we would all agree upon? So we have four tires, driver front, um, passenger front, driver uh, back, and passenger back. How many people chose driver front? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many chose passenger front? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Driver back. All right, one, two, three, four, five. And then passenger back. One, two, three. So hopefully that adds up to roughly around 30. Definitely seems like there was a predisposition to some. And you know, the question is, you know, what is your thought process? You know, what is your way to come up with what you expect would be a canonical choice? All right. So anyways, one of the goals for the class is if we can get 10,000 people to support a idea, Lego will consider building it. So right now there are things that we could do that would make the cube work better. It works right now. Is 10,000 supporters hard to get or not? What do you think? If you just post it on the Lego Ideas page, yes but this is the era of social media, right? Divide 10,000 by 30, what do you get? Thirty-three. Yeah, so the, the zero matters. Yeah. If it, so if it's, you wanna get a rough estimate of, should I be concerned, should I do this? So years ago, I was at the American Institute of Mathematics and I was given, with some of my colleagues, a very interesting problem. Take the digits one through nine. There's a way to arrange them as three fractions. Each fraction has a one digit numerator and a two digit denominator. Each number is used once and only once. And if you do it properly, the numbers will sum to one. And so some of my your friends are top mathematicians in the world and they start proving lemmas about where the five must be or the nine must be. I write a code in Mathematica. I don't even bother to write an efficient code in Mathematica. How many ways are there to place the nine numbers? Nine factorial. Okay, so I'm assuming most, is there anybody who does not know what a factorial is? So nine factorial is nine times eight times seven all the way down. Who knows what four factorial is? 24, five factorial, six factorial, all right, so most people know up to about six factorial, which is actually it's exactly 720. So we need to multiply that by eight times nine times 10. Well, nine times eight is 72. So you know, if I want to just quickly estimate this as a thousand, I would be off by a little bit. And if I called it a you know, thousand over two, that'd be underestimating a little bit. So just as a quick estimate, I would say, nine factual would be about maybe 360,000. That's a rough estimate. 
what this means is I don't have to worry about coding efficiently. It took me less time to write the code than it took them to start proving their lemmas. And if you think about it, if I have three fractions, I can actually permute the order of the fractions first. I can always assume whichever fraction has the nine occurs first. And that would save me a factor of six. But it would take me longer to save the factor of six by coding it than to actually just code it inefficiently. So for a lot of problems in the world, you really want to be thinking, how long is it going to take me to do this? Am I going to be doing this multiple times? Is it worth making this more efficient? You want to get a sense of how difficult is the problem. If I asked you to get 33 friends to support an idea, is that an onerous challenge? Should everybody be able to get 33 people? Yeah, that doesn't seem that unreasonable. If I asked you to get 33,000 people, that would be a little bit unreasonable, especially given that you only need 10,000 people. 330, is that a lot for each person to get? Well, when you consider your social networks, you know, could you get a good fraction of your social networks to support it? Do you think you could get at least 100, 150? Out of curiosity, is there anybody in this class who knows somebody else in this class? Okay, not surprising, right? What kind of intersections do you expect your social networks will have? Ideally, what you want to do is you want to start getting people in different parts to support an idea. You know, do you know somebody at Michigan, at Ohio State? How many of you are familiar with Six Degrees of Separation or the Kevin Bacon game? So how far do you need to go before you find somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody? So it'll be an interesting question to see, can we get to the 10,000 people without too much trouble? All right, let me go back to slides. Okay, so the main thing that I want to do is I want to do a better job on this. One of the big problems is always, what pieces do we have? So the actual Lego Rubik's Cube that we can build is not gonna be just a larger version or a Lego version of a real Rubik's Cube. We don't have the pieces that have the right shape. So I have previously gone online and purchased a lot of pieces there in my office. I will put them out here and let you guys explore and just see what you can do. We can open this up and see how the connections are being done. I do not assume that these are the best, but this is the best we were able to do to still have things turn and pull out without too much trouble. There were other things where we pulled it out, but you'd also pull out some of the cube as well at times. It's, how many of you play sports? Are you familiar with muscle memory? That there are things you can just do instinctively, and if you had to do it at a slower speed and do and slow it down and explain it to somebody, it's going to be very hard to do it because you're used to doing it at a regular speed. A lot of times, old Rubik's cubes no longer turn well, and it is much harder for a lot of us to solve them because we're so used to doing certain steps just all in one motion that when you have to do it slowly and think about what you're doing. So I would love to get the cube to the point where it is usable in a reasonable amount of time. I would love to get it smaller than this, but it's a function of the size pieces we have. You, know, there would, you would need to have a major advance to make it smaller than this. In previous years, we've done bridge building. Some of you might have seen that, or speed building. You know, if people want to do something like that, I'm happy to consider doing something like that again. There's always an outreach for the elementary school. So this year, um, they have every January classes that meet one day after school, you know, three or four times. Not surprisingly, most people like to teach the fourth, fifth, sixth graders. They're a little bit older, sometimes more mature, a little bit more you can do with them. There was a real need for classes for first to third graders. So I am going to be doing a Lego class at the elementary school on Wednesdays from roughly, I think, 1.30 to 3.30. And we're going to be doing, as the main theme, stop animation, you're making small little Lego movies. Uh, the last thing is I've written six different books, most of them math textbooks, some of them a little bit more on the popular side. I have talked to a major publishing house about doing a popular book on Legos, on Legos and math. So there's a lot of books already out on the market. And one of the things you always want to think about before you do something, is there a real need for doing this? How many of you have taken calculus? How many of you took calculus in high school? How many of you used, how many of you took calculus in college? How many of you used the same book in high school and college? There's a tremendous number of books out there. 
And there's also a large number of different editions of the books out there. If you really work hard, you can find a difference between the sixth edition and the fifth edition. Frequently, it's the ordering of the homework problems. And I won't say that this is because it forces people to buy new books so that they can't just give the same homework assignments. That would be wrong to say something like that. But you might wonder why do we need a sixth edition of this book? What is in the sixth edition that wasn't in the fifth or the fourth or the third? So before you do anything, you always want to think about who is the market. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to some Lego sets later today. But if we write a book, you don't want to write a book that's already out there. And so I have done a lot of work in schools using Legos as a springboard to discuss mathematics, which a lot of this is going to be uh, here. And so I think there's a real opportunity to write a fun book. Unfortunately, this would not count as a writing intensive requirement for the college. I will use this as an opportunity to uh, state that I believe the writing intensive requirement is still incorrectly written in the course catalog. Does anybody know what the writing intensive requirement is for Williams? Given that you are all undergraduates hoping to get degrees at Williams, you should know what the requirements are to graduate. Does anybody know? Yes. You need two writing, you need two writing intensive classes. Okay. When? Trivially, you must have the two writing intensive classes before you graduate, yes, but it's actually more than that. So it says one by the end of sophomore year and one by the end of junior year. It says something like, you must take one writing intensive class by the end of your sophomore year and one writing intensive class by the end of your junior year. If you take a writing intensive class your freshman year, have you taken a writing intensive class by the end of your junior year? Yes, you have. Now, clearly they mean that you should have your second class done by the end of your junior year. Otherwise, it's stupid to say one by the end of sophomore year and one by the end of junior year. But I think the writing intensive requirement should be well written. You want to be clear on what you're doing. Uh, this is an opportunity to actually do writing that will be read by people and not just go into a recycle bin. So I think there's a lot of wonderful chapters that could be done. All right. and All right, so just some of my Lego qualifications. The base plate of my Lego of my uh, wedding cake was made by Lego. Let's zoom out. Uh, lots of different kinds of challenges you can do. So this was a challenge I gave myself at Peres, no, Peres, the, um, at the library when they had those buckets of Legos outside. You know, what can I do in under 10 pieces? So can anybody identify this? Which spaceship? It's not Star Wars. It's Star Trek. It's supposed to be the Enterprise, you know, with the saucer section and the warp nacelles. But one of the things that I love about Legos is, you know, what can you do with the pieces you have? When I was young, the pieces sucked. <laughs> yeah, they have far too many special pieces now <clears throat> where you no longer have a challenge of figuring out how to do things. You know, the piece actually that's connecting the two of them to the base is actually a you know, V-shaped piece. You have three dots, you know, dot, dot, dot in like a right angle. It didn't have pieces like that when I grew up. The Lego sets now actually are good. You know, when you build something, you actually want to keep it. When I was a kid, the Lego sets were terrible, which was, I think, better for creativity. It forced you to put them back in buckets. And so for the first week in terms of mechanics, you know, I'll just introduce some of the materials, some of the things we can be doing, uh, some of the mathematics, and then we'll discuss ideas. And if there are things we need to purchase, we want to put in the purchase orders as fast as possible. It can sadly take a week or two for supplies to arrive. Right. Um, I'm just quickly going through the, that stuff. It's online. This was just from you know, previous iterations of the class. So I've mentioned the outreach activity at the elementary school. I'll be sending an email later today to you know, confirm who is interested in coming. If people are interested in movie nights, you cannot show a movie in general unless you can link the movie to a course. Given that this is a course on Lego, there is an academic compelling reason. So if people are interested in any of that stuff, just let me know. All right, so the course mechanics. So I'm assuming everybody knows basic algebra. I'm not assuming calculus. I'm not assuming any of the advanced methods of statistics. I will talk a little bit about those. And if anybody wants to learn more, I'm happy to do so. I understand that this is a winter study class. But this is a chance if you want to explore things a little bit more. 
we sadly don't have as many opportunities to offer you know, general fun math courses because of all the requirements for the major, all the requirements for other departments. This is an opportunity for those of you who may not be math majors to explore things a little bit. Always happy to chat. Uh, how many of you know why we no longer have a high pass for winter study? Yes. It would actually bring down some people's GPAs. For what, which people? Law school. So when there used to be a high pass, a pass, a perfunctory pass, and a fail, law schools counted that as there were four levels of grades. And so if you didn't get a high pass, it was counted as a non-A grade when law schools were calculating people's GPAs. And so because of this, the high pass has now been eliminated. The first time I taught the class, the goal was to build the 3,152 piece Superstar Destroyer from an unopened box in under 10 minutes. It was painful why we failed. We just barely failed. The second year we succeeded. And the second year I told everybody, I'm not failing two years in a row. If we do it, everybody gets a high pass. If we don't, everybody fails. And so I believe we, we had over 40 people that year. I believe we set the record for the most high passes ever in a winter study. And that is not the reason why the high pass has been discontinued. But we were able to do it in about nine minutes. What was interesting on that is we had a lot of elementary school and younger kids helping out. Do you think they built as well as the college kids? What do you think? Both answers are supportable, but you have to give me a reason. Give me a reason why not. Because they're smaller and younger. They're smaller and younger. Give me a reason why they might be as good, if not better. They play with Legos. They play, they, hopefully they play with Legos more than the college <laughs> students. They're more active. They're also smaller, which might actually help them in terms of getting more of them around a table to build things. For a lot of things, I don't need everybody to be building very fast and efficiently. Some people can build slower if I don't need their thing until the very end. So I had two of the kids building something that just drops in and you know, covers part of the ship. That's the last thing we need to add, really. They can build it much slower than college students, and it's not going to hurt. So you really want to think about how do you want to allocate the people you have when you have tasks. So it was actually a lot of fun doing the speed build challenges. There were a lot of good issues in terms of allocation of resources. All right. So we've talked about the cube. So we've talked a little bit about statistics and trying to find what's a good way to describe what's going on. And so for your building, you, know, you might care about how many pieces can you assemble per minute, but maybe different types of constructions are more challenging than others. For some things, I might care more about uh, you know, speed than accuracy. If we're building a challenge, I need both. But which do I care most about? Anybody know the story about this bridge? It's about 620.1 meters. Um. Uh, you know it, sure. Really know it. So this is the, the bridge, uh, where it's the, like the director of measurement. Like, oh, no, 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 no. So I, I don't know how long ago it was. I think it might have been in the 60s or 70s. There were college students from uh, MIT that would go uh, to the bars on one side of the bridge. Um, and they got very drunk one night. and. I took this guy Smoot and laid him down, however, I guess 364 um, times across the, across the bridge. Um, and so that's the unit that they measure in now. I heard he was a pledge to one of the fraternities. I think that's right. And you know, there's a lot of things you can and cannot do with pledges. Using them as a unit of measurement turns out there's nothing that says you can't do that. And I love the plus or minus one ear as the accuracy of the measurement. But you know, it was answering the age-old questions. You know, how many of our pledges would it take to go all the way down the bridge? The city of Cambridge was not pleased with the markings on the bridge, and the bridge was cleaned up. Well, that wouldn't stop the community. So they just took Smoot again, and it went back and forth until finally the police said to hell with it. And now it's become institutionalized in the area. And they actually have Smoot markers. And when there was an accident on the bridge, they report how many Smoots from the edge of the bridge was the accident. 
So unit analysis. Is the smooth a good unit? No, it's a terrible unit. Right? MIT has created a lot of terrible units. They've created the Bruno. It's the indentation, I think, in cubic centimeters when you drop a grand piano from a like, third floor building. And I believe they do this every year now. There's a lot of really bad units. We want to find good units to describe the real world. Now, one of the things that is interesting is you never know where experiences in life will lead. The first winter study class I ever taught was on introduction to cryptography. And one of the first types of cryptography you learn is the Caesar cipher, where you shift every letter forward by three. So A becomes a D, B becomes A, and Z becomes C. You just wrap around the alphabet. To some extent, this wasn't really needed because so few people could read back then that just writing the message down is almost good enough. I encrypted the name of the class. And the registrar contacted me and said, do you really want <laughs> as the title of your class? This is going to be on official transcripts. I said, absolutely. It's going to be a conversational startup. And several of my students told me that over the years, when they were interviewing for jobs, they said, I got to ask, what is this on your transcript? So you always want to think about when you're going to be interviewing for these things called jobs, you know, what can you do to shine? What can you do to control the conversation and put it in a way that will be good for you? Taking a class, you know, the mathematics of Lego, that could easily raise some flags you know, in future years. But you know, seize opportunities. You never know where they will lead. So I know at least one person knows where this leads. Anybody know what happened to Smoot? You know, the poor pledge who is used as a unit of measurement. I believe he did eventually become a brother in the fraternity, but more importantly, he became the chairman of the American National Standards Institute. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. And I'm just trying to imagine his job interviews. Well, I, I don't like to brag, but I am a unit of measurement. So think about what you're doing and think about how you can distinguish yourself from other people. There is a tremendous number of qualified people. I've never gotten a job because I know a fact that somebody else doesn't know. You get jobs because you can make connections. You get jobs because you know people and you can be noticed and taken off the pile. And it's one of the things I'm happy to talk to you about. If any of you are getting ready for job interviews, happy to give you either a mock job interview, which I've done with some students, or giving you some pointers. Uh, one of the biggest things which most people don't seem to realize is if you have a Skype interview or a phone interview, you can have notes to yourself out of the camera angle. And you, these are things I want to cover. Or, right. So this leads to the question, what are good statistics for the Lego sets? So we have Lego sets. What kind of numbers should we associate to a Lego set? What might be a good thing to look at? So one is number of pieces. What else? OK, age ranges. Number of the specific pieces, the number of like the square. Of the right, so, the, so not just how many pieces, but what the pieces are. What else? You're missing something extremely basic. This might be the difference between, yes, I was gonna say, the person who buys the set and the person who receives the set. You know, a big thing is the price. Lego sets cost significantly more now than when I was a kid. How do you figure out what's a good price for a Lego set? Well, we trust the Lego corporation, whatever price they put on must be a fair price. And again, it doesn't have to it, just saying, it doesn't have to be the best metric, but I want something. Oh, that's right. So like a fair price, how much it would cost to buy So one thing is is to look at individual pieces. Now it's not always easy to buy the individual pieces. Uh, I don't know if this has been done at Williams, but I've definitely been on colleges where they have like a combo deal, like a hamburger, soda, and fries. And it's cheaper to buy each item individually than to buy the value combo. A lot of places do this to see who's paying attention. Now, there's economies to scale, and if you're buying the individual pieces, it will probably be a lot more expensive than buying the whole set. 
When Lego is deciding what sets to build, they hate it when new pieces are, are needed or small numbers of pieces are needed. As an aside, um, has anybody ever seen the Superstar Destroyer? It is in my office, but in parts in, on the inside, you'll have nice yellow and red. Right, is everybody here familiar with Darth Vader? Okay, I can assume that this is culturally known. Do you associate bright colors like yellows and reds with Darth Vader? Why would Lego have bright colors like this in their Superstar Destroyer set? And no, it's not because he's a good father and that when Princess Leia visits him, he has a nice little... Yes. Uh, oh, probably because they're not going to be seen externally. Good, they're not going to be seen externally. So when you're building the set, they become really good anchors. So that, you know, oh, thank God, it's something that's not a gray. Because when everything looks the same, how do I know where to put the piece? It's going to be very easy to be off by a little bit. If you have a couple of bright pieces that I'm going to be seeing at the end of the day, those are great ways to quickly look at things. So we're trying to find, you know, what's a good measurement of, is it a fair price? So one thing is to look at how much it would cost the individual pieces and then assemble that. But there's something related to that. So we've talked about number of pieces. We've talked about cost of the set. How do we compare different sets? So you've got to come up with a statistic. So I have a Star Wars set. I have a uh, Frozen set. I have a Lego City set. I have an architecture set. Yeah, co cost per piece is probably a really good statistic. Do you think it's a perfect statistic? No. So here is a, your Star Wars X-Wing. What's really nice is Lego has a tremendous number of slightly different X-Wings so that people can keep buying them. Because you know, every time the new Star Wars movie comes out, you have a slight little tweak. Um, as an aside, uh, anybody here see the Batman movies? Uh, a couple of years ago, I was able to get Michael Uslan, who owns the movie rights to Batman, to come and visit Williams and talk about that. And one of the things he said is when you make movies nowadays, one of the big factors is what is the toy components? You, know, you have to have at least so many ships, at least so many different things that you can spin off when you consider how much of the money is made other than the ticket sales. So this is 560 pieces as of a few years ago. The pieces those changed were selling for $120 or 21 cents per piece. This was a frozen set selling for 22 cents per piece. So pretty comparable. But it's something that both Lego Star Wars and Lego Frozen have in common that's very different than Lego City. Can anybody think about what those two things have that would be different than Lego City? They have the rights. Yes. So Lego would have to pay the rights uh, to use these. So I wrote a math book a few years ago of you know, 100 great problems, one for each year, to highlight the 100th anniversary of an organization. And there was one problem that's called the Sleeping Beauty problem. So I contacted Disney and said, we would love to use a picture of, so what's Sleeping Beauty's real name? Aurora. Aurora, excellent. We would love to use a picture of Aurora. And Disney said, sure, but it'll cost you this much. Like, I, no, you know, we're not gonna pay that money to use the image. It wasn't worth it for us. We thought it would have been great for Disney to have their princess actually being used in a math problem. And so a lot of times you have to decide what is it worth to you. I know somebody who was working in a company that had computers and the makers of the original Star Trek movie back from the 1970s wanted to use those computers for a couple of months to do some of the special effects. And you know, the computers were very expensive back then, and they wanted to just borrow them and then return the computers when they were done. And it could, no, you know, once we give you the computers, we can't sell those computers. And so they went back and forth in negotiations. And one of the things that was mentioned is, well, what if we give you credit? Okay, well, where will you give us credit? You know, at the very end of the movie, we'll have a line saying computers provided by, no, nobody's really staying in the theaters and watching that. Is there gonna be a special on the making of Star Trek? And if so, would you feature our computers prominently then? There was a special on making of Star Wars. 
And so you can go back and forth and you can say, well, what is it worth it to me to give you this? Is it worth it for, you know, uh, it used to be Lucas, now it's Disney that owns, you know, the Star Wars rights. Is it worth it for them to give the rights free to Lego to make these sets, to get these sets on people's minds? Will they then buy other products? Or should they say, well, we like the idea of you selling this stuff, but we're going to charge you a bit. What if they just ask for a percent of the profit? So that's often done is you know, we'll take a percent of the profit. In the original Star Wars movie, only two actors, I believe, took a percent of the profit and not a flat salary. One of them, I believe, was R2-D2. And I think the other was Alec Guinness, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who had enough money that he could afford to take a chance on something like this. You know, a lot of people, they can't afford to roll the die. But if you've already got, yeah, sure. You know, rather than taking a small additional salary, I'll see if I strike it rich. I've done a lot of work for the movie industry. Uh, does anybody know how movie theaters make money? Concessions. Concessions, far more typically than ticket sales. So frequently you get a higher percent of each ticket sold the longer the movie's been out. What's the problem with that? Yeah, the longer the movie's been out, the fewer people are going to see the movie because they've already seen it. I was talking to a adult colleague of mine who says he's seen Frozen 2 five times, which surprised me, but um, <laughs> I haven't seen Frozen 2 yet. But most movies, the demand goes down as time goes on. There's a lot of movie theaters, especially in summer months, where they'll sell tickets for like a buck, or maybe even the movie is free, because they just want you to buy the reasonably priced popcorn and soda you know, for the experience. And so it's a really interesting question as to which movie should you purchase. Uh, out of curiosity, how many people were born in the 1990s? Okay, so some of you at least are still, was there anybody who was born, I think, before Star Wars The Phantom Menace came out? All right, so there's two of us. So I remember when The Phantom Menace came out, it was exciting. It had been a long time since the Star Wars movie had hit the theaters. We didn't know at the time what was going to happen. I had a deal with the local movie theater. I actually got 300 tickets the night it opened. We had a wonderful party. It looked good at the beginning. I won't say what happened afterwards. A lot of theaters decided not to show Star Wars because George Lucas had so much control that he could say, well, look, if you want to show The Phantom Menace, you have to promise to show it for, say, eight weeks, and you have to have your best screen, your largest screen available the whole time, and you have to have at least this level sound system because otherwise you will not appreciate the subtleties of the Jar Jar character. And a lot of theaters looked at it and they said, well, you know, there's going to be so many theaters showing The Phantom Menace that it's not worth it for us to commit to using our best screen, to upgrading the sound system. Uh, they said, well, you know, we really should have updated our sound system anyway. This gives us the push we needed. But it was a real interesting calculation. Is it worth doing this or not? So when we have things like the Disney Frozen or the Disney Star Wars, Lego has to pay money to these companies for the merchandising. Does it make sense for Lego to do this? Do they get enough additional sets sold? Uh, here is the 3,152 piece Superstar Destroyer. It used to be around $400 on Amazon. A few years ago, it was selling for around $1,000. That's now 19 to 25 cents per piece. Again, this is a collector's item. It's worth a lot more in an unopened box. Now the London Tower Bridge, 240 bucks for 4,295 pieces. It's only 5.6 cents per piece. Why do you think this is so much cheaper than these? You don't have to buy the rights. To... So one is you don't have to buy the rights. In fact, I believe, anybody know where the London Bridge is now? Sorry? I think it is actually in London. Just, it's like, who's buried in Grant's tomb? But there is a famous British bridge, which I believe was bought by somebody and is now somewhere in the United States of America. So one thing is we don't have to pay the rights, but do you think the rights is enough for factor four, essentially, in cost? Or is there another reason why this set might be so much cheaper? It's probably cheaper because the cost of the pieces 
doesn't matter so much, but they can charge more for a Star Wars one because it's much more desirable, so they will. So one, so one possibility is always, what will the market bear? And in fact, if you look at how much Williams charges in tuition, you know, not everybody pays the same amount. Yes. I was gonna say maybe like the sophistication of the pieces. Ah, yes. What do you notice when you look at the set? Yeah, a lot of the pieces are basic, are the same piece again and again and again. Um, we actually have that set in my office if anybody wants to really look at it. It doesn't have the same piece complexity as other sets. The question is always how much should all this count? Uh, this is the Millennium Falcon, uh, which if you have the original one was selling for $6,000. My brother got it when he was married. He unfortunately opened it and built it. <laughs> <laughs> So I have mentioned the Lego Idea Challenge. This is a little bit of what they look like. Um, I'm not going to go through all this stuff in too much detail. Here's one of the ideas from one of the groups in previous years in trying to determine the price of a set. There's other copyright costs, are there special pieces, how many pieces, what's the different types of pieces, and who is the audience? So years ago, I forget if it was Mindstorm, if it was something before that, Lego came out with a system that allowed you to program things. And they got very upset when some adults were actually hacking into the system and adjusting things. And then somebody finally slapped them and said, are you crazy? You know, the whole point of Lego is let's play. You've got people who are willing to play and not just any people. Who's doing this hacking? Who do you think it is? Do you think seven-year-olds are doing the hacking? Who do you think is doing the hacking? Adults. What is the biggest difference in purchasing power between an adult and a little child? <coughs> a lot. So what's the real difference? Children, don't make their own money. Children typically don't make their own money, and they can't buy a set if they want. An adult can. And so from a marketing perspective, do you want to market your products to just children or do you also want to have adults? <clears throat> Sometimes you want to be very careful that if you do something, it doesn't destroy your brand image. Years ago, there were two people who went to Disneyland and they decided to have fun and dress up as two of the Disney characters. Disney security very quickly went up to them and escorted them to the gift shop. And Disney said, we're gonna buy you some clothes right now. You cannot go through our parks dressed as you are. Why? Right. You know, can you imagine, say, you know, a drunk Peter Pan picking fights with people? You know, they wanna be very careful about how things are presented. I don't know if you can now do this and get free Disney clothes by going down there <laughs> dressing up. But it's your very interesting protection of you know, the brand. Um, so the question is always when you're building a set, who is the audience? So you know, again, the Rubik's Cube may not be the best choice. We've had other choices we've thought about over the years. My hope is that this is something that would appeal to a large group of people. You know, there's a lot of people who do do Rubik's Cubes. The question is, do you have to pay royalties to Rubik? Or are there now so many different knockoffs that you can have some kind of cube like this? It would be better if it actually had the word Rubik in the title, but maybe it's not needed. So here's the plot of prices per piece for different sets and you're putting in the name. So you know, over here, you know, the Tower Bridge comes in at a pretty good cost. So, Vertical axis is price, horizontal axis is number of pieces. So the lower you are, the lower cost per piece you have. And you can see that a lot of these costs are well given by a straight line. So there's a lot of very interesting relationships here. And so for those of you who are interested in writing your know, chapters for a book, there's a lot of great stuff to go in here. So they were trying to do something from, I think, Game of Thrones. Uh, but you know, again, one of the problems is if you don't have the right pieces, it looks okay, but it's not going to look great and it's not going to win. So the nice thing about a Lego Rubik Cube is it's not too bad to make it actually look like what it's supposed to. 
Uh, they thought that this is a really good range to be in, just looking at how many different sets there are that are clustering around that line. That's a pretty good cost per piece. Okay, so this yeah, so this, you know, uh, I've sent you the slides. There's a lot of different links if you want to read more. Uh, a lot of different case studies involving Lego with various things. A lot of different relationships that are linear. So again, I don't know what statistics people have done. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a sense of what's out there. This is looking at optimal cruise speed at sea level versus mass for organisms and airplanes. It's a beautiful straight line but it's not initially a straight line. If you look at the vertical axis, you see it goes from 10 to the zero, which is one to 10 to 10 squared. And the horizontal axis is even worth going from 10 to the minus four to 10 to the eighth. That, how many of you have seen logarithms? Okay. How many of you have been told why we care about logarithms? I, not as many. So it's not you just have sadistic teachers who have material that they need to cover and they were taught this, so they have to teach you this as well. Logarithms can often create a better way of viewing data. So the simplest function we can understand is a straight line. If you take logarithms, you can often convert nonlinear relations to linear relations. So a great example uh, in physics, the law of gravity is your force, is equal to g m1 m2 over r squared. And so if you try to understand what's going on, it's a nonlinear relationship. The force is proportional to the reciprocal of the square of the distance. But if you take logarithms, you get the log of f is the log of r squared. So it's going to be a minus 2 log r plus the log of g m1 m2. And so now you have y equals mx plus b. So you now have a linear relation. And you can sniff out maybe the best bits. How many of you have heard of Kepler's laws? So the first Kepler law, I think, is planets travel in elliptical orbits about the sun. The second is they sweep out equal area in equal amounts of time. And the third is the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the length of the semi-major axis. This is like Sesame Street, one of these is not like the other. You know, this is a more complicated, the square of the period is proportional to the cube. You know, how do you see something like that? It's a very nonlinear relationship, but when you do a log-log transformation, it becomes linear. And so one of the real keys in math and stats is how do you present information in a way to convince people, to show people what's going on. And so what's fascinating here is you see for the most part a good, uh, linear relationship. You know, you've got your 747s and your 777s up here, pretty much in the same with, you know, B, although bees can't fly, a crane, a wren. For cultural extra credit, how many people have seen the bee movie? Who are the stars of the two main bees? Even one of the main bees. One of them is Seinfeld. The other one, you'll probably know him more for Simba rather than for Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So unfortunately, my kids are still a little bit too young. My kids are 12 and 10, so my cultural references for current day America is a little bit off. <laughs> Much better on the 70s and 80s. So is that enough of a hint? Matthew Broderick, I believe. Right. Uh, scaling of differentiation in networks, nervous systems, organisms, and ecologies, ecosystems, businesses, university cities, electronic circuits, and Legos. Technically, I don't think you're supposed to say Legos. You're not supposed to, I believe, put the yes, but everybody does it. And so again, I'm not gonna go into all the details. This is a log log plot of something. And what you notice is this incredible relationship. <clears throat> so again, what I really wanna do in the first class is just give you a little bit of a sense of what's out there. All right. Uh, so let's skip all this stuff. Another way to use Legos, and this is something I've done a lot in uh, elementary schools, is for counting. 
Now, given that we're talking a little bit about Rubik's cubes, I thought it would be fun to talk about the God number. So the God number is if the Almighty were given a mixed up Rubik's cube, no matter what cube you gave the Almighty, they would be able to solve the cube in at most that many turns. And this is a plot of the upper and the lower bound as a nice function over time. And it's now been proved that no matter what, you can always solve a cube in at most 20 moves. And there are some cubes whose mixing does require 20. This is a tremendously difficult problem. Now for the two by two, it's not so bad. There's 3,674,164 configurations. That sounds like a lot, but for a computer, that's not terrible. Um, I don't know if this actually says how many, uh, okay, for the three by three cube, you know, it tells you how many, okay, so anybody know what size number that is? Is it? Oh, it does say quintillion, okay. Because I know over here, this is the millions, the billions, the trillions, quadrillions, so it would be 43 quintillion. You want to get a sense of just how bad are such numbers. This is bad in terms of if we wanted to evaluate everything, but not tremendously horrible. You know, for some of the stuff in cryptography, um, if every subatomic particle in the universe was a universe, and every subatomic particle in that was a supercomputer devoted exclusively to you, running since the dawn of time, it would not be enough to make a dent in some modern day encryption. Just give you a sense of how secure some things are to brute force attack. So the question is, how do you handle something like this? You, we have this many combinations to check. Uh, the four by four is still unknown in terms of, you know, what is the minimum number of moves for somebody who is intelligent. For a lot of things, it's actually better to just solve rather than to take the time and figure out, well, how can I solve it most efficiently? You'll spend more time trying to figure out what the best solution is. All right. So here's a fun number, 915,103,765. And this was said as the number of ways you can combine six two by four Lego bricks of the same color. So these are not the same color, but they're close enough. Do you agree that this is the right number of ways to count, that this is the right answer for combining two two by four bricks? I'm sorry, six two by four bricks. Does it seem reasonable? I think there's infinitely many ways to combine them. So one of the big things to worry about is are you making assumptions? You are all assuming something. If you don't assume it, there's infinitely many ways to combine them. So does this count as a combination? And if so, I can keep sliding them like this and there's infinitely many ways to place them. Well, if I have to connect them, you know, I, I can turn the angle and there's infinitely many like that. So you always want to have a well-defined problem. So what should we say first? Let, let's get a well-defined problem. What kind of requirements do you want to impose on me? So one is they have to be connected. So that will eliminate your first thing. So is this acceptable? So if this is acceptable, there's gonna be infinitely many ways. So they have to be maybe at right angles, that you have to connect them so they have to be at a right angle. The difficulty in the calculation was if you look at this picture and you know, the person is happy because they're building Legos, they're making something that's six units high. Are you assuming that when you connect them, it has to be six units high? Or can I go up and then go back down? So depending on how you phrase things, it's going to matter. How many of you have ever played tic-tac-toe? So I believe I am still the current defending champion at the elementary school. They have a tic-tac-toe on the playground. It's been years since anybody's challenged me, they've learned. And, you know, every now and then, you know, when my kids were younger, there would be some kid who would think they could take me down. And you know, they, they learn that life is hard. 
How? I'm sorry? Isn't it really? If the first move gets to start, they're going to run. It depends. How many opening moves are there in tic-tac-toe? <coughs> Nine. How many responses are there? So you have 72 pairs of initial moves. It gets worse the further you go. Now, at some point, if somebody has three in a row, then you can stop and you don't have to continue analyzing that tree. In a lot of sports, you have a best of seven. Once a team has won four games, you don't play the other games just, well, you know, let's just keep playing. You, know, you stop. So if I go, you go, I go, you go, I go, hey, I want you. Know, we're not going to continue playing. We're going to end over there. So when you want to figure out how many games are there, it's not just nine factorial because some trees will end. But I claim that there's a better way of looking at this, that there's not nine opening moves. How many opening moves are there really? Up to symmetries, not one. Three, why three? What are the three moves? Center. So the four corners are the same. And in the middle. It's very similar when you do the analysis for the Rubik's Cube. I often take my daughter and I'll actually like rotate her 90 degrees or 180 degrees when I go to elementary schools. And if you turn her upside down, you're going here, it's really the same as going in any of those corners. So there's really only three opening moves. And then for each opening move, you look at how many responses are there. Well, the easiest is if somebody goes in the center. How many responses are there in the center? There's only two. You know, the corners are all the same. And if you look at the other two cases, each of the other two cases only has five responses up to symmetry. So there's really only 12 pairs of initial moves, not 72. That's much easier to analyze. And some of them are particularly easy to analyze. Do you want to go first or second? So chess, it is unknown if you want to go first or second. Most people prefer to go first. Most people think there is an advantage to going first. It is open. Checkers has been solved. Chess is still open. For tic-tac-toe, do you want to go first or second? Can it hurt you to go first? No. The goal is to get three in a row. Right? It just gives you an extra spot. Where do you think you want to go? Center. So there's only two responses. Let's say somebody goes there. They choose the bottom. Where should you go? You have a couple of places that will work. Which corner? Yeah, so if you go over, you don't want to go up in the upper left because if you go here, then when the person goes there to block you, they're getting three in a row. If you come down here in the bottom left corner, you are attacking three in a row and you're blocking O down here. So O has to go over here. This makes the game very easy to analyze where you know what your opponent has to do. Now on your turn, is there a place to go where you're attacking in two different ways to get three in a row? Yes. Top, top, left. top left would work, any place else would work. Uh, center left over there. So you have two different places to go. So if I go over here, I actually, I would prefer going over here just because then O can go over here. I'll go over here and say, wow, but you played a really good game. You, know, you almost won. You almost had me. I just, you, know, you can make them feel a little bit better about themselves. But it makes the analysis a lot easier if you think about things. So for tic-tac-toe, we agree that it doesn't matter. When we're doing our bricks like this, if I put the initial brick on my left, your right, is that the same as putting it on my right, your left? Not in physical three space. I can't physically, boy, or can I? Can I just turn them and are they the same? Yes? In reference to the number of connections, it's like maybe something. Well, it depends on what you define as a connection. Do you define this as a different connection or the same connection? 
physically, if I just spin it, these two are the same. I can't tell the difference. Do I want to count them as the same or different? Sometimes it's easy to count them as the same, sometimes it's different. Now, what if I put it over here on the bottom heading to the left versus over here, the bottom heading to the right? I can no longer spin and make them the same, but if I were to look at the reflection in a the mirror, they would be the same. Should I count those as the same or different? Who says different? Who says same? So nobody voted for the same. Is there anybody here who is bio or chemistry as a major? Okay, it's very good that you did not say same because for a lot of chemical compounds, the molecule that might save your life will kill your life if you have the mirror image. And so this is a real problem. So this is the enumeration of all the different cases with just two of the bricks. Um, okay, well, I, I guess I didn't include the... Um, stuff here, but if you do have the mirror image, it's sometimes better to count that as a different configuration because for chemical properties, there will be differences. From a mathematical analysis of something like tic-tac-toe, however, we're perfectly content to count them as the same. Because if all I care about is you know, how many different types of structures, well, if I allow myself reflections, they are the same. But for real world applications, there are times when that might actually matter. So there's a really nice paper that develops good mathematics and they count how many configurations will you have using six two by four pieces of height two, three, four, five, six. And when you add them all together, you do get the 915,103, 915,103,765. But if it has to be exactly height six, it's only about 102 million. Interestingly, the largest one is height four. People surprised that there were no height ones. Why not? You have height two, three, four, five, six. Why aren't there any height ones? Yeah, we define they had to be connected. So whenever you see results, you always want to ask you know, a quick sanity check. Is this a reasonable answer? One of my favorite websites is the OEIS, the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences. You can actually go online, plug in numbers, and it will tell you if it knows anything about that. And it will provide a tremendous amount of information. And so, you know, here we go. It's the number of ways, count up to symmetry, to build a contiguous building with n Lego blocks of size two by four. So just from um, previous years, we wanted to build a Lego suspension bridge. I don't know if anybody was around long enough. The first year we got, we did not get the permission I wanted to build it across the chasm of Pereski. So we did a small one over the mantle. And then using that the next year, so I guess it's still somewhere, we got permission to do it on the ground in Pereski. And it worked well. And then the year after that, we actually were able to build it across. We had to promise that we would only have freshmen reaching over the ledge and working like that. Because yeah, you know, seniors close to graduating, becoming an alum. <laughs> You know, donating back to the college, you know, freshman, you've been here, what, a couple months? <laughs> so we only used freshmen. We did not lose any college students. We did lose a few Lego minifigures who did plummet down. And we had to uh, have the area very carefully roped off down below so that people were not hit by falling Lego. But we were able to build entirely out of Lego a bridge going all the way down. So you know, this is just one of the fun projects we did over the years. There's a lot of mathematics here. I'm not going to go through this now. I will, you know, I've sent you the slides. So if there are things that you guys want to see, you can tell me and I'm happy to lecture on some of those. You know, there's supposed to be some uh, academic content to this. One of the other projects we tried to do years ago was related to speed racing. But, you know, again, it's an issue of having the right skill to do something meaningful. And when you have Legos of this size, it's hard to have really good detail work. There's a lot of micro sets that allow you to do much finer work. But you know, for the Lego Idea Challenge, we have to be with Legos. This is the nice thing also about doing the Lego Rubik's Cube. There's really not that much detailed work that needs to be done for that. Uh, just some fun Lego artists. I'm assuming everybody can identify this. Right, this is a costume from Big Bang. 
Anybody remember that episode where all four of them dressed as the Flash? So the artist, I think, did a phenomenal job of giving a sense of motion to a static sculpture. And you know, the level of detail you can do is wonderful if you are building something life-size. And we talked earlier about you know, buying all the pieces individually, and you're thinking, what is the cost to do something like this? Um, just a couple of other images, I like the ducks, your know, playing card. It would be fun to have a deck of cards like that, but it would be a little bit uh, impractical. They did build a life-size Lego X-Wing, and it was on display in New York City a few years ago. And they basically took the real Lego set and they made giant versions of each Lego piece and then built it like that. So it was really a scaled up version of the set. Right. So this is basically what I wanted to you know, cover for the first day, give you guys you know, a rough sense of what the class is, you know, what the different ways we can go. I am quite happy to do some mathematical lectures and talk about how you can use Legos as springboards. I do a lot of you know, different projects. One of the best theses I ever supervised was on game theory related to the Fibonacci numbers. So tic-tac-toe, is this a fair game? What's your definition of fair? Okay. And what is the chance if people play intelligently, what's the chance that the first person wins in tic-tac-toe? Zero. What's the chance that the second person wins in tic-tac-toe? Zero. How many of you have ever played Connect Four? How many of you ever played Connect Two? You're never going to play Connect Two where the first person to get two in a row wins because whoever goes first, unless they're a complete moron, is going to win, right? Connect Two is not a fair, interesting game. There are some games I know that are rigged where either player one or player two will always win. There are other games I know where player one or player two will always win if they play intelligently. There are some games where it's known that a certain person has a winning strategy, but it's a non-constructive proof. So out of curiosity, how many of you have taken a calculus class? All right. There's a great result in calculus called the intermediate value theorem. If you have a continuous function, if it's five at some point and 11 at another point, then at some point, it must hit every number between 5 and 11. There must be some time when it's 6, must be some time when it's 7. This could be used to give people speeding tickets. If you use your easy pass or fast lane or something like that, and it records you know, how far you've traveled and what your average speed is, you must be traveling at least your average speed at one period in time. And so if your average speed was 78 miles an hour, you must have been speeding at some point. We don't know where you were speeding, but we know you were speeding and here's a ticket for you. So we do not have that yet, but it has something to think about. This is a great reason to take breaks. You know, let me stop stretch. Oh, no, so I gotta be very careful what I'm saying. Of course, the best thing to do is not to speed and to follow all. My parents have retired to Arizona. There is a town that they need to drive through to get from where they live to Tucson, where the town gets a lot of its revenue from extremely active enforcement of every traffic law. How many of you have ever changed lanes while driving? How many of you have signaled? How many of you have waited for your signal to flash six times before changing lanes as required by law? One of my parents' friends received a ticket for her reckless driving and endangering the people in the greater Tucson area. It is on the books. You must have the signal flash. I don't know if this is national or just where they are. Must flash six times before changing lane. I'm sure it's a coincidence that this is generating revenue for the town. So there are games where we know a certain person has a winning strategy, but we do not know what that winning strategy is. If you've taken mathematics like the intermediate value theorem, the intermediate value theorem or the mean value theorem, these are extremely useful results but they are non-constructive. Anybody know what's going to happen in November of 2020? I'm sorry, an election. I do not want to discuss politics. Right now, the Democrats are having primaries. Some candidates have dropped out. 
who was the last candidate to drop out? I think it was Castro was the last one to drop out. Imagine that you are a consultant and you go up to Castro, don't drop out. I've done the math and I can prove that you have a path to win the Democratic nomination and get over 270 electoral votes in the general election. That's wonderful. What do I do? Well, it's an existence proof. How valuable is that going to be to Castro? Is it completely worthless? It's not completely worthless because it's nice to know that there's a path. Is it the most valuable thing you could tell Castro? What would you want to tell Castro? How? How should you do this? And again, I want to try to avoid getting into the details of policy and just talk at the higher level of the mathematics. About how many votes would you need to switch to convert the 2016 election from Trump to Clinton? I believe it's under 100,000. If you look at the Rust Belt, the very end of the campaign, Trump was campaigning in states like Wisconsin, which he did win by small margins. It's how do you allocate finite resources? Which places do you choose to go? If you just have an existence result, it's, it's better than nothing, but frequently it's not good enough. So there are some games that I can show you, some mathematical games, where I can prove to you that a certain person has the winning strategy. And annoyingly, I cannot tell you what that winning strategy is. So we know that there is an advantage if you play well to being either player one or player two, but we can't tell you how to play. So again, I love to use Legos as springboards to talk about fun things, you know, tic-tac-toe. We all agree that there seems to be an advantage to being player one. What you could do is you could try to make tic-tac-toe more interesting. So there's a couple of ways to make tic-tac-toe more interesting. One is to play on larger boards and require that you have more pieces in a row. And one thing you could do to try to make the game fair is, let's say we're working on a 20 by 20 board and you need five in a row. Maybe whoever goes second, they get a couple of pieces already placed in the perimeter of the board. So if the game goes on long enough, those pieces come into play. The favorite version of tic-tac-toe that I find interesting that I can talk about very quickly is bidding tic-tac-toe. So there's a couple of different variants. This is the one I like most. Each person starts off with say $1,000 and it's like monopoly money, the money doesn't matter. And on your turn, you have a sealed bid as to how much you are willing to bid for the right to make the move. And whoever bids the most wins the move. Whoever bids least gets the money from whoever bid the most. And if you both bid the same amount, then you just rebid. What's nice about this is if you have an advantage over somebody, let's say you know more math, you can actually have the other person start off with more money. So let's play right now. And you know, I'm, I'm not gonna try to win. Somebody wanna tell me how much they wanna bid for the first move. I need some number. You have a thousand dollars and I have a thousand. I know how much I'm bidding. I can trust myself because I didn't put plants in the class earlier. That's the real reason I was honest. How much does somebody want to bid for the first move? Okay, how much? How much? Okay, I bid 500. Na, 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 na. So I'm gonna go there and you now have $1,500. Right. You have your second bid? All right, we need somebody else. Somebody else have a bid? I need somebody, who, who has a bid? Raise your hand. All right. 100. All right, I bid $400. So you get my money again. Oh, you're in real trouble now. And now what happens? I'm sorry? Yeah, so basically you can now kill me because you can now make sure you get the next three bids. 
I've been way too much for the first two. I'm really excited. Things look great for me. They look bleak for you. Oh, whoops, class is over. We better stop now. And since I've got two and you've got none, we're going to call the game. No. You know, this is why you play the entire game. It doesn't matter what position you have. It matters what happens. And you have a tremendous cash reserve. Rather than being too careful with, you'll bid $200 for the next move. And you'll go there to at least walk me. So I went down to $100. So now I have $300. And you have $1,700. How much do you bid for the next move? $400, yeah. We're just going to keep the math simple. So you go down to $1,300. And I go up to 1700. You have 700. And he says 700. Uh, it's good. It's a wonderful comeback. Right. So, how much? I, I have to go all out. I have to stop you from getting the next move. So, you bid 800. So, you bid 800. And then you win. And it doesn't matter that I have more money. Now, what you could do is you could toy with me, you could let me win. And go here and then just you know, go in more places and just draw out the game. But there's no need to do that. So the question is, how much is that first move worth it for you? You clearly want the first move, but how much? And what I like about this now is, now the game of tic-tac-toe is completely fair. There is no difference between first and second player. And if you have different mathematical skills, you can give somebody more money to compensate. I have done some work I'm on the Undergraduate Residence Life Advisory Committee about how to deal with some room draws and how to give some compensation to JAs. I had more extreme mathematical proposals, which uh, is not going to be implemented, which I'm happy to talk to people when the system is not recording. But when you have something like this, it's not immediately clear how much you should pay for the first move. You want it, but at what cost? Other versions of the game, there is no tie. There is a tie-breaking chip. And if you have the chip, if there's a tie, you choose whether or not you want to win or lose the bid. And if you choose to win, then you give the chip to the other person. If you choose to lose, you hold on to the chip. Why don't I like this? I'm sorry? Someone starts with the chip. And so the game is not completely symmetric and fair. All right, so this is a good place to start. Let me just turn off all the different recordings.